Hello, everyone. Welcome to Other Voices Online, brought to you by Peninsula Peace and Justice Center. Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Paul George. What an extraordinary day here in the world's oldest democracy. Pretty stunning turn of events in Washington, D.C. I thank you for tuning in, regardless of what's going on. I'm sure there's a lot of news that you've been glued to all day and you could still be glued to. So I, I thank you for joining us here on Other Voices Online. Uh, out of uh, regard for the events of today, we're gonna adjust our uh, format just a little bit. Uh, I will shorten up what's usually a half hour interview with our guests by about 10 minutes or so. And we'll add that time to the Q&A and discussion time where you can participate. And we will take off the um, uh, requirement that your comments be on topic. If you want to, ha if you have a comment or feelings you want to express about today's events, use that time during the uh, audience Q and A. Feel free to to do that. Uh, hopefully, we can keep our discussion mostly on the topic, which is the U.S. and the incoming Biden administration and the the Greater Middle East. Uh, but my, people might want to be inspired to talk about some other things today. So uh, that will be okay during the, the Q&A. Our topic is Joe Biden and the Middle East. This is the first of a special series that we're launching called Collectively Joe Biden and, and we'll try to take a look at major issue areas. Next week on uh, Thursday, the uh, 14th of January, we'll have the renowned international anti-nuclear activists uh, Jackie Cavasso, who's also been a, a guest on this program many times, uh, talking about the current nuclear, nuclear weapons situation. It happens that later this month, a new UN treaty calling nuclear weapons uh, illegal will go into effect. Plus, the only remaining arms control agreement between, the Russia, between Russia and the United States expires two weeks after Joe Biden takes office and what will he be able to do about that? And then we're gonna do a segment on Joe Biden and climate change. And finally, Joe Biden and universal health care. I'm still looking for guests for those, but stay tuned. Uh, we hope they will all prove to be uh, educational and motivating for you to take action on these issues coming up in the future. Today's uh, program is Joe Biden in the Middle East, as I mentioned, and we're gonna do that by looking at the situation through the eyes of the United States longtime key strategic ally in a key strategic region, Israel, which also brings up the long standing issue, especially for progressive activists of the right to self-determination of the Palestinian people. We're gonna get to that. And we will take the conversation broader around the Middle East because Israel has just engaged in a whole bunch of agreements with a number of countries there. We're gonna take a look at what that's all about. Plus, Israel is having its own internal political problems and our State Department has made some rulings that might affect our own activism here at home. I hope I can get to all of that. Uh, so thank you for being with us and here we go. Joel Bainan is my guest, I'm really welcome. Well, I had to welcome back Joel. Joel is Emeritus Professor of Middle East History at Stanford University. Uh, he's written or edited over 11 books. I think it's now 12 with the, the release of his latest co-edited book, A Critical Political Economy of the Middle East and North Africa from Stanford University Press. And I might also mention that Joel Bainan was the very first guest on Other Voices when we started broadcasting in November of 1993, so uh, 1997, some 23 plus years ago. Joel Bainan, welcome back to Other Voices. Glad to ha have you with us. Thank you very much, Paul. It's always a pleasure. Joel, how is retirement going for you? You're up there in Portland now. Uh, I, I'm not gonna ask you about the weather, but how is retirement treating you? Pretty well, actually. Um, a lot has not changed. Uh, I still have several graduate students uh, left from when I was uh, actively teaching uh, and I'm uh, closely engaged with them. I'm still writing, you mentioned the most recent book, uh, Critical Political Economy of the Middle East and North Africa that came out less than a month ago. 
so I'm I'm still doing things. Um, uh, I have more time to play music. Yeah, that's good. That's good. You play yourself. Uh, yeah. Meaning, <laughs> not not playing on the uh, hi-fi and listening to it. No, no, no. Hi-fi. No, I play the ouds. It's uh, you know you can't see it in the background there. Oh, that's right. It's there. that's right. I, I did know that. Okay, well let's let's uh, get into it because I do want to try to expand the uh, audience participation section. Um, and before today, I was going to say I want to start on the topic that's on everyone's mind worldwide, and that's the pandemic, COVID. Uh, can you give us an idea and maybe compare and contrast to how COVID, how the pandemic has affected Israel? has affected uh, Palestine um, and how the vaccine rollout is going in in the two areas? Uh, Well, we'll start with the vaccine rollout, which has been extraordinarily successful in Israel. Uh, Israel has now vaccinated 15% uh, of its uh, population, which means uh, 15% of the Israeli citizens and the residents of East Jerusalem. Um, So Palestinians who live in East Jerusalem are being treated just like Israeli citizens. Palestinian citizens of Israel are being treated just like Israeli Jews. In fact, Palestinians, uh, Palestinian physicians are highly disproportionately uh, representative uh, in the Israeli medical system. But no Palestinians in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip have yet been vaccinated and there is no plan to have them vaccinated. And the Palestinian Authority is trying to import uh, vaccines from elsewhere uh, and so far uh, has not uh, successfully uh, been able to make a deal. And in any case, those vaccines would have to be imported uh, via Israel as well. Uh, Gaza Strip is a total disaster. I mean, Gaza Strip has been a disaster on multiple uh, uh, dimensions for, for some years now. Uh, but the medical system is in total collapse and they have no capacity to deal with this whatsoever. It sounds like um, they are not going to get vaccinated, uh, perhaps in the Gaza Strip. Doesn't that represent a health uh, risk to the greater area? In principle, it should, but remember that uh, the Gaza Strip is essentially on lockdown even before COVID happened. Uh, Only a very small number of people uh, have been authorized to uh, go in and out of the Gaza Strip and and most of them via Egypt, which has uh, closed down that border with the Gaza Strip uh, since COVID, uh, at least officially. I don't know what might be happening on the margins of things. Um, So uh, Gaza continues as an open air prison as it has been basically uh, since uh, Hamas uh, won the last uh, Palestinian legislative council election in 2006. I I think describing it as having been on lockdown longer than anybody else, uh, even before COVID is uh, is a really good way that people can kind of understand just what uh, existence, the reality of existence in, in Gaza especially is like. The, does the Palestinian Authority have the funds to get vaccines? Uh, they do not, but uh, Qatar uh, has been funding uh, Hamas in the Gaza Strip and other uh, Arab uh, Gulf uh, states have been funding the Palestinian Authority. So. Uh, the United Arab Emirates has given a lot of money to the Palestinian Authority in part because they are uh, trying to position their candidate to succeed uh, President Mahmoud Abbas, who is very old and will soon be gone from the scene one way or the other. Uh, but they, they, are, they are devastated economically as well as on, on many other dimensions as well in the, in the West Bank as well as in the Gaza Strip. And part of that is the uh, Trump I've for four years I've been using hesitating to to use the word administration with them because they're not administering anything but uh, the Trump government uh, has cut off a a substantial funding for for Palestine including pulling all of the US funding for the United Nations uh, refugee program uh, that's been working in Palestine for so long. 
Where else has um, the U.S. cut off funding, and, and what is the effect of the, the cutoff to the organization that's known as UNRWA, the, the UN uh, Refugee Relief uh, Program? So uh, UNRWA, the UN Relief and Works Agency, um, does several basic things. First, um, it's the primary network of schools in refugee camps. Uh, second, uh, it has uh, medical clinics. Um, and third, it uh, provided food relief for people uh, who were unemployed or, or otherwise uh, had insufficient income. Um, all of that has been very dramatically cut back. UNRWA uh, hasn't been able to pay teachers' salaries, for example, and, and other administrators' salaries. Um, in addition to completely cutting off uh, the United States' contribution to UNRWA, other countries, of course, also contribute, but the United States was a significant contributor. Uh, in addition to completely cutting off contribute to contributions to UNRWA, the United States has uh, also sharply cut back on uh, aid to uh, Palestinian NGOs. I mean, there was this whole rubric of uh, peace building, which of course there hasn't been any real peace building for quite a long time, uh, but, but that's a way cut back uh, uh, as well. And um, the European Union has tried to make up for that, but uh, they're, they're unable to, no, they're unwilling, I would say, rather than unable to do that. So this is something we can look at uh, in try to gaze into the crystal ball about uh, the incoming Biden administration. Uh, can we expect them to immediately restore the, the funds to the to UNRWA, the United Nations uh, Refugee and Works uh, Administration? I don't think the Biden administration is gonna do anything immediately about Israel-Palestine. Um, in so far as the Middle East is uh, on uh, President Biden's uh, to-do list, uh, the Iran nuclear deal is going to be number one uh, priority. I mean, they, they are going to try uh, to restore that, that um, as for as long as Benjamin Netanyahu is prime minister of Israel, he is going to pull out every trick he can to, to prevent that from happening. Uh, and also uh, the Saudis and the Emiratis uh, are not going to be very happy with that uh, notion either. Um, Iran may not be so willing to jump right back in either uh, because uh, uh, the United States uh, has uh, killed uh, General Soleimani a year ago and uh, Israel apparently has assassinated uh, uh, Professor Fakhri Zadeh, who was the uh, chief uh, nuclear uh, expert of Iran. Um, and so uh, the hardliners in uh, Iran are saying, uh, with uh, considerable justification, I would say, uh, you can't believe the United States. Their, their word is not good for, for any agreement. Uh, and they let Israel run amok and kill whoever they want to kill and, and, and uh, invade our uh, systems. I mean, talk about hacking governmental systems. Israel has been doing that to Iran for quite some time. Um, and there's a presidential election coming up in either May or June. I don't remember in Iran this year. Uh, the current president is not going to run for re-election. Uh, Odds are good that someone with a harder line on nuclear issues than he will be uh, elected, although we don't know who that might be at this point yet. Um, so the most important thing for the Biden administration in the Middle East is going to be Iran, and that's not going to be nearly as simple as people imagine. In so far as Biden is going to be looking at the Middle East at all, um, at, at Palestine and Israel at all, uh, he will probably be favorable to the idea of restoring the American contribution to UNRWA. Uh, that's not a big deal. It's not very much money uh, by American standards. Uh, he will probably also be willing to reopen the Palestinian uh, uh, diplomatic legation in Washington, D.C., which the Trump administration shut down. He will definitely not reverse the United States uh, recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's uh, capital, uh, because every uh, Democratic as well as Republican 
uh, president has run with that in their platform for decades. And then whatever president got in simply uh, pulled some security uh, reason for uh, not following through with that as the Obama administration did. Uh, but now that it's a done deal, uh, it would cost too much political capital for Biden to reverse it. Uh, Biden also will not reverse um, the Trump administration's recognition of Israel's annexation of the Golan Heights. Um, so do not hold your breath waiting for the Biden administration to bring about Israel-Palestine peace. Advice taken, uh, not holding breath. Uh, for our audience members, would you just run over the significance of the annexation of the Golan Heights in case people have forgotten that even happened? There's been such a swirl of other news these past four years. Um, just let's, let's keep so the, that in context. The Golan Heights uh, is still officially Syrian territory that Israel occupied in the course of the 1967 war. Israel uh, officially uh, annexed, they don't use the word annexed, they use the words apply Israeli law to the Golan Heights in 1981. Uh, the United States was actually pretty annoyed uh, with Israel when that happened and the Reagan administration uh, slapped Israel's uh, wrists and uh, uh, pulled out of a strategic uh, collaboration agreement for about a year or so. Um, as a punishment, the, Uni the United Nations Security Council passed resolutions condemning it. The United States voted for those resolutions, but voted against uh, any kind of sanction, uh, actual sanction uh, on Israel for that. Um, and that was the state of affairs for the next uh, almost uh, 40 years that nobody recognized Israel's annexation, but Israel is the power on the ground and can do what it wants unless anybody intervenes and nobody did. Um, and uh, then all of a sudden, uh, Trump administration comes along and uh, Sheldon Adelson, among his uh, uh, array of asks of President Trump in exchange for his virtually unlimited financial support, says, I want you to recognize Israel's annexation of the Golan Heights. Trump probably didn't know where the Golan Heights was before he. <laughs> but, I yeah. think that's a safe assumption. <laughs> sure, Sheldon, whatever, fine. I mean, of course, Jared Kushner knew, and David Friedman, the ambassador to Israel, uh, knew, and, and they were the motors uh, behind the, the, this particular maneuver and the Jerusalem uh, maneuver as well. Uh, just quickly to, to look back at uh, Biden's desire to, to re-enter the uh, uh, nuclear deal with uh, Iran, uh, what especially can uh, Israel or Saudi Arabia or the United Arab Emirates do to try to stop that other than yell bloody murder and complain about it? Um, uh, Israel, well, Israel of course, assassinate another nuclear scientist, for example, and try to blow everything up. What, what yeah, would you it, look for them to be doing? It, it, Israel has the capacity to hack into Iran's uh, governmental computer uh, uh, network. They have already hacked into the nuclear uh, network and and. Uh, with the Stuxnet virus disabled uh, uh, many of the uh, centrifuges uh, a couple of years ago. Um, so that they have vast cyber intelligence capacity now, um, probably the best in the world. And uh, th they will use it uh, unless the Biden administration comes down very hard and says, don't you dare. Uh, I don't think Biden is capable of that, frankly. Um, I mean, he said Benjamin Netanyahu is my friend. I mean, the, 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 we're, go, we're going into the situation with, with, with that. Um, the Saudis and the Emiratis uh, will kick and scream, but they actually don't have very much capacity. They're certainly not gonna launch a military assault on Iran. Uh, they've already failed miserably in trying to uh, install their uh, 
candidate as president of Yemen and uh, provoked uh, the Houthi rebellion and the war which has go been going on there for years and which is now an enormous humanitarian disaster. Uh, they the failed. Right yes, uh, the, the Saudis and the Emiratis failed in trying to impose uh, a, a diplomatic quarantine uh, and boycott on Qatar that just ended the other day. So that's all over. So, so they are very weak read. And one of the reasons that the Emiratis and the Bahrainis wanted to uh, openly uh, recognize Israel and, and normalize relationships is because there has already been for several years covert, but not very covert because it's been public. If I knew about it, it means lots of people knew about it. Uh, <laughs> relationships between Israeli cybersecurity firms and cybersecurity uh, organizations in the United Arab Emirates and even in Saudi Arabia, which hasn't yet, uh, but would very much like to normalize relations with Israel. Uh, so, the, so those uh, the, the cyber uh, attacks on Iran are, I think the biggest thing that could possibly happen. I mean, Netanyahu could, of course, launch a missile. Trump could launch a missile in the next two weeks. Uh, but I, I, I think probably not. I, I think after today, Trump is probably politically weakened enough not to get away with that. Although that was certainly a concern uh, for the closing weeks of his administration. I'm getting a little concerned about our time, but you, you just brought up the uh, United Arab Emirates and Bahrain uh, finally, after all these years, recognizing uh, Israel diplomatically. There have been a whole series of accords, um, I think, all collectively coming un under this rubric of the Abraham Accords uh, with similar actions, the UAE, Bahrain, uh, Sudan, Morocco. Uh, what is behind all these? Uh, you mentioned the cooperation between Israel, the Emirates, and Bahrain has been going on. But why, why Sudan and why Morocco? What are, what are they getting out of this deal? So um, Morocco has also, for a long time, had um, semi-public uh, uh, relations with Israel. They opened up uh, a diplomatic uh, office in Israel uh, after the Oslo Accords were signed in 1993. Uh, and then uh, they, they froze it after the second intifada uh, erupted uh, in uh, 2000. Uh, but there's been Israeli tourism to Morocco, uh, there are some business deals. Um, Morocco is very far away from Israel. It has nothing to do with Israel and Palestine. Um, so uh, this is just, you know, uh, Morocco has been getting more and more um, U.S. military assistance. The Trump administration also recognized Morocco's occupation of uh, Western Sahara, uh, which has been uh, going on since 1975, uh, as, as, alongside Israel's occupation of the Palestinian territories and Turkish occupation of Northern Cyprus. Uh, that's the other of the three longest uh, standing uh, occupations uh, in, in the world. Um, so that, that had to do with Morocco and the United States. I mean, not, nothing changed with regard to Morocco and Israel on that one. Uh, on Sudan, uh, Sudan is a different deal entirely. Uh, Sudan is simply interested in getting off the list of state sponsors of terrorism. And the tit for tat was, okay, you recognize Israel and would take you off the list. Um, and uh, there's a little problem there. The generals, the Sudan had a popular uprising, uh, the most, the closest thing to an actual revolution of any of the Arab popular uprisings since uh, December 2010, January uh, 2011. Uh, they now have a uh, transitional government which is split between the military and the civilians. Military, uh, cool, they met with Netanyahu already months ago in February, January, February uh, of last year. Um, and they wanna make the deal. 
uh, because they, they don't have a problem with Israel. Uh, the civilian wing of the government says, wait, well, there's a transitional government. We can't make this deal. This has to be approved by a legislature. We don't have a legislature. We're not having elections for another almost two years. So Trump announced that Sudan has recognized Israel. Netanyahu said, yeah. And the prime minister of Sudan said, well, no, we don't think we actually did that. What we <laughs> need to do was talk about it. And, and, and I think Sudan has in fact been taken off the list. Will, they, yeah. will the sanctions that were imposed on them as a result of that be completely removed? Uh, that, that's still, I think, unclear. At least I don't know the answer to that. Okay, and then finally, before we turn to our audience, um, and I know this is not a short one to address, but uh, the outgoing administration is another thing that I, I'm wondering if Biden will reverse, although I think I know the, the answer to this. But uh, not too long ago, uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo issued a, a ruling from the State Department that uh, the State Department from now on would consider uh, advocates of BDS, um, boycott, divest, and sanction Israel. One of the, the major grassroots activist uh, tools to uh, address the ongoing Israeli occupation of Palestinian territory, he, he the State Department has declared that anybody uh, promoting BDS, uh, that will be seen as anti-Semitism and it brings all kinds of sanctions and impositions against such activists. Your comments on this, does it affect activists um, here in this country? Is it meant to keep people from traveling to Israel? Uh, and can it be reversed? Will there be the political will in the new administration to reverse this? Uh, so the short answer is none of this is going to be reversed because it will cost too much political capital uh, for Biden to do it even if he wants to. And it's not even clear to me that he would want to. Uh, as far as I know, the ruling of Mike Pompeo regarding the State Department has had no impact on American citizens in the United States. Uh, the State Department doesn't have any authority over American citizens in the United States. Much more uh, uh, damaging is the ruling of the former uh, Assistant Secretary of State for Civil Rights, uh, Kenneth Marcus, who was booted out of office uh, of several months ago for abusing his powers, but between August of 2018 and, and uh, some, sometime last summer, he did lots of damage. And um, he uh, directed uh, the, the Office of uh, Civil Rights of the Department of Education to use the definition of anti-Semitism promulgated by the International Holocaust Remembrance uh, Association. The de their definition is not really so problematic. It, it's vague, but it's in the traditional realm. But they give 11 examples of what anti-Semitism is. And seven of those 11 examples have to do with Israel. And it's pretty clear that what that's about is policing speech on, uh, about Israel. And um, within two months of Marcus assuming office and issuing this ruling, um, a, an effort to uh, uh, have a joint vigil for uh, Palestinians killed in the Gaza Strip and the uh, tree, uh, victims of the shooting of the Tree of Life synagogue in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, that would, was being organized by Students for Justice for Palestine and Jewish Voice for Peace at um, UC Berkeley, was shut down. And that was only the first of several. There are probably half dozen at least uh, such efforts to um, close down or object to uh, events on college campuses where Israel is being criticized uh, in ways that the uh, right-wing Zionists don't like. Uh, Trump is not gonna shut that down. Um, uh, Biden. Uh, but yeah, Biden is not gonna shut that down. 
uh, he, he, uh, it may be that whoever becomes assistant secretary of education for civil rights won't push it in the same way as the Kenneth Marcus, because that was really his baby. I mean, he set up a whole Lewis Brandeis Center for Civil Rights under law to promote this idea. Uh, but um, the, the Jewish federations of North America have issued a policy memo uh, for the incoming Biden administration in which they say promoting the definition of anti-Semitism used by the International Holocaust Remembrance Association is one of their priorities. Uh, so will Biden listen to them? I, he may not do exactly what they want, but he will not spit in their face either. Before we uh, started broadcasting, you and I were talking about You've been speaking at Peace and Justice Center events uh, on this topic and others for uh, over 30 years now. And this has been one of the biggest challenges for over 30 years now is trying to get across the point that criticism of the government of Israel is not anti-Semitism. And now they've got an official policy and shutting down educational events on university campuses. Um, it's, it's just sad. Let's uh, well, get our audience. Know, it, uh, and let me just yeah. jump in here and say, it's sad, of course, but they're only doing it because now there are such events. If you think back 30 years, there were very, very few events where Palestinian voices were heard, where Palestinian perspectives were considered seriously. So there has been enormous progress in the United States, which, which is the hardest uh, place outside of Israel uh, to do this work. Uh, that doesn't mean that we're about to win. I don't believe we are, but still there has been an enormous amount of progress. I, I appreciate you bringing that up and you're absolutely right. And, and that is a very good thing to bring up because there has been a lot of progress just on awareness of this issue uh, and concern about it uh, over these, these past 30 plus years. Okay, um, here's how you who are watching from home uh, can participate. You want to find the little raise your hand thing to let us know you want to participate and you have a question or a comment. And uh, we do have a director working behind the scenes and he will work on making you uh, a panelist briefly. And that means you're going to see your Zoom screen disappear very briefly. And when it comes back on, you're going to be asked again to confirm your audio and your video, and then you'll be on screen as a panelist and able to uh, ask your questions. So I see Rafe and Karen were on first, and while TD is bringing those on, um, TD, am I going to see them when they show up and know that they're on? I see them. Um, okay. Well, let's let's um, and you need to unmute yourself. Rafe, Rafe? Yes. yes, Rafe. Hi, welcome. Thank you. Uh, hi, Joel. This is Rafe. Hi, Rafe. Hi, Rafe. How are you? Good, good. Uh, I am uh, interested in your opinion on the role and the rel relative strength of uh, organizations like Jewish Voice for Peace and J Street as in, in relation to the uh, more established Jewish organizations, Jewish Federation, etc., and and how things are evolving within the U.S. Jewish community. So, I think it's fair to say that at the very top, um, say the Council of Presidents of major American Jewish organizations, um, the right wing is still. Uh, fairly solidly in control, um, and in part that's due to money. Um, the, the, the Jewish communal institutions are as strong as they are because um, they are pretty well funded um, for a long time. Jews have a long tradition of autonomous uh, communal organization, goes back hundreds of years uh, uh, to Eastern Europe, Poland especially. Um, and that's been maintained and expanded in the United States. Uh, but um, they have lost the youth. Um, 
Jews under 40 uh, are, are not nearly as identified. Jews under 40 who are not Orthodox. The Orthodox are about 10% of the American Jewish population. Non-Orthodox Jews under 40 are much, much less identified with Israel and much more critical of Israel uh, than their elders. And one of the expressions of that is that you know, uh, universities are one of the main places where critical discussion of Israel and Palestine happens. And as in the example I gave you of the UC Berkeley event, it was Jewish Voice for Peace and Students for Justice in Palestine doing it together. And on some campuses, a third of the members of uh, Students for Justice in Palestine are Jewish. So there's, an, there's been a big, big shift among Jewish youth. They simply do not buy the story that their elders uh, believe and, and promote. Um, that has only very, very minimally uh, begun to be represented uh, in the political sphere. So J Street thinks that they have scored a huge victory because a majority of the Democratic Caucus of Congress uh, supports two states. Well, I mean, excuse me, but I don't think two states is actually a very likely outcome at this point. And saying that you support two states, but not being willing to exert any pressure on Israel to get to that point is essentially saying, oh, the occupation can continue forever. So I don't think, I mean, J Street has a lot of very well-meaning people in it, and they're, uh, but but they're politically just nowhere. Um, on the other hand, you've got Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar uh, and Jamal Bowman, who was just elected to uh, Congress. Uh, these folks are great on Israel-Palestine, uh, and okay, that's three representatives out of uh, how many are there? Four hundred and thirty-five. Um, so, you know, we're a long, <laughs> long way from, from anything happening. But, you know, now, now we have debate. Um, uh, there, there was the, uh, 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 in the last Congress, the um, No Way to Treat a Child uh, bill that was uh, uh, sponsored by, I think, altogether 18 uh, members of the House. Uh, again, that's 18, it's not very big, but you know, it wasn't not too long ago where nothing like that could be imagined. So there's been briefly a shift. Explain, briefly explain what that bill was, Joel. For uh, so it, it's a bill that says that US military aid uh, cannot be given to, is, to Israel if it uses it. Well, US military aid cannot be used to abuse children, to put them in jail, to torture them, et cetera, which Israel does regularly. Um, right. you know, that, it's never going to pass in, in the current balance of forces. And of course, the Biden administration is going to be totally set against it. But um, this is a sea change. It is a change. All right. Karen Lemus has joined us. And it looks like you've got your video and microphone all on. So go for it, Karen. Welcome. Yes, thank you. Um, I don't know whether you remember Lise Grande back in the 1980s when she was a student at Stanford then worked with me in uh, the sanctuary movement and as well as uh, Palestinian rights and then went on to uh, ever since then be a um, member of UN uh, uh, High Commission on Refugees uh, and so she she would be a wonderful guest, Paul, uh, for you to have. And she might be interested in zooming back to her uh, uh, old stomping ground. Send uh, me an email. <laughs> OK. All right. Thank you. OK. Thank you, Karen. And I see, I don't think we have uh, any other guests online right now. I would encourage you to hit your raise the hand button and, and join us with a question or a comment. We do welcome comments on here. It doesn't have to be a question. So while we're uh, waiting for our uh, 
shy audience members to come online here. Let me ask you, um, Joel, about we're just wrapping up our election, but uh, Israel for the second time in a year coming up in March uh, is having uh, elections once again for prime minister because their coalition government has collapsed. And at the same time, uh, Bibi Netanyahu, the longest serving prime minister in the history of Israel is on trial for various uh, fraud charges. The outcome of the possible outcome of this election, um, I don't know what's happening with the election, who's favored and what it can do long-term, if anything, to the relationship uh, between uh, the United States and Israel. It, it's like the relationship has been between the United States and Bibi Netanyahu for so long. It's no longer there. Is there any chance of this relationship having a, a major shift? Uh, uh, the short answer is no. So first of all, um, <laughs> I knew you were gonna... <laughs> in, in part because Israel has been so successful in launching the coronavirus vaccination program, um, Netanyahu has collected a lot of credit for that. Uh, it's not exactly that wow. he deserves the credit, but he's the prime minister when the Ministry of Health and the, the coronavirus czar and all of those people who have implemented this have done that. So he, 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 the credit is reflected to him. Secondly, uh, people who were only very recently in the Likud have split to form another party uh, led by Gidon Saar, who retired from politics several years ago after he came in second with 25% uh, of the vote in the Likud primary uh, campaign to challenge Netanyahu for the leadership. So some people said, oh, see, Netanyahu won overwhelmingly, no problem. And other people said, wait, sorry, 25% against a sitting prime minister who's been extraordinarily successful. Uh, that means he has fair amount of support. So he went home for a few years uh, and now he's come back into politics and established a new party. And um, like flies, half a dozen uh, people, uh, uh, include Likud members of uh, Knesset, have left and said they're going to Gidon Saar. Uh, why? Because politically, there's absolutely no difference between Gidon Saar and Bibi Netanyahu. It's just that Gidon Saar isn't corrupt. So you got your choice between uh, a corrupt right winger <laughs> and a not corrupt right winger who politically, no, there's absolutely no difference between the two of them. And then on the further right, uh, the Yamina uh, party, um, which also consists of people, uh, Naftali Bennett and Ayala Chakade, who were formerly in the Likud, they are the two leaders, um, they are doing better in the polls. Um, so the chances are good that there will be a right-wing government uh, which Netanyahu is not the head of, uh, although I would not write Netanyahu off. He is a political magician. He is very, very skilled uh, at, at, at political gamesmanship. Uh, so he could very well be the prime minister again after the March election. Um, the Zionist left is a total basket case. Uh, maybe uh, between the Labor Party, which isn't really left at all, uh, and, and Meretz, which is the traditional left Zionist party based in kibbutzim and the urban cosmopolitan uh, elements. Uh, between the two of them, they might get 10 uh, Knesset seats out of uh, 120. Uh, maybe if they're really, really good, they'll get 12, but you know that's like nothing. And the joint uh, list, uh, which is mostly Arab parties, which currently has 15 seats, uh, according to the polls, is going to go down, and that's because they're fighting with each other and they can't keep their unity together. It's very difficult because you've there's four parties involved in this and they don't agree on very much. Um, so uh, the elections aren't likely to bring about a very big political change in Israel, one way or the other. 
Okay, I see a hand up if TD can get Cheryl on real quick and then Owen. And let me just make a note of who's coming on here. Okay. Um, this was going to be my, my wrap up question, but we've got a couple of people coming on, but I, I will uh, down this path. I want to ask you what your recommendation for activists here in this tree who are still, uh, would still like to see Palestinian self-determination, whatever form they eventually take. What should we be looking at uh, focusing our attention on uh, during the upcoming uh, Biden years? So there, there has been um, a certain demographic shift in who is being active and speaking about Palestinian rights. Uh, you now have um, second and third generation Palestinian Americans um, who are very educated, absolutely, totally fluent in American uh, culture and in English. Uh, and they have established organizations uh, that they lead. So for example, Palestine Legal, uh, whose uh, executive director is Dima Khalidi, who is Rashid Khalidi's uh, daughter, um, uh, Adala Justice Project, who is led by uh, Sandra Tamari, uh, the sister of Salim, uh, of uh, Steve Tamari, who taught briefly uh, at Stanford when he was a PhD student uh, uh, at Stanford. Um, so these organizations, um, are the ones who are laying out a new agenda. And their agenda is to try to reunite the Palestinian people, the diaspora, the ones under occupation, the ones who are Israeli citizens, the ones who uh, are in refugee camps, uh, very complicated and difficult political project. They need to do that work. We, there is nothing that non-Palestinians can do except support them financially and otherwise. Uh, uh, they need to do that work. Um, that's the big change that has happened. Uh, for, I think another change which has happened is that because the uh, youth of the American Jewish community, the non-Orthodox youth of the American Jewish community uh, are now uh, raising lots of questions, and in some cases, even very vociferous objections to the policies that their elders have blindly supported for decades. Um, there is space to do work in the Jewish community. Uh, as I see it, these are not the same things. Uh, a different language has to be used to be successful uh, in the Jewish community than the language that, um, let's call it the new Palestinian movement uh, will, will use in, in organizing itself and in speaking uh, to, to a broader audience. And there's actually been some um, friction uh, over that, not necessarily between organizations, but um, uh, it's, it's not such smooth sailing. Uh, just to give an example, um, uh, I, I, I joined a synagogue recently in Portland. It's a, a very progressive synagogue and they let me teach adult education courses on Israel-Palestine. There are probably three or four other synagogues in the entire United States who would allow that. Um, but so, okay, on the one hand, they allow it. On the one hand, they allow, not only allow it, I've done it three or four times and it's very popular. But I can't speak to them as if I'm a Palestinian. I mean, I have to speak to right. them as a Jew, um, and that's a that's a different it's a different discourse, uh, and uh, there, it's a certain amount of political maturity that's required to understand that that this is part of the same struggle. 
Well, thank you. I, I will uh, get some more information from you uh, offline afterwards uh, about these organizations and others, because one of the things we do with uh, other voices online is try to be sure, since we've got everybody's email addresses, is to follow up uh, with our own email with additional resources for people to follow up. So it'd be good for them to know about these organizations. They choose to support them financially uh, or whatever. Uh, so I watch for an email from me asking you for a little more help on, on, on this topic. Okay, Cheryl, thank you for your patience. Cheryl Spencer. Um, is good evening. Audience member here to, to yes, ask. Yes, good evening. Hi. And, um, Hi. I'm, I'm um, speaking to you uh, as a member of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. We are looking forward to the 22nd of January when the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons goes into effect because 51 countries have ratified that treaty. Uh, we believe that Israel has nuclear weapons, uh, although they, they, they've never actually admitted to it. But what do you know about Israel and its nuclear weapons? How would they be delivered if they chose to attack Iran, for example, with a nuclear weapon? Have you any knowledge of this? Oh, Thank yeah. you. Thank you for the question. It's actually a very important one. Israel definitely has nuclear weapons. They, they don't admit it, but no, no one serious uh, uh, has, has a different view. They definitely have them, and they definitely have missiles uh, to deliver them. Um, it, they may not be fully assembled, I mean, but that's a technicality. Uh, estimates are that they have 200 nuclear weapons. Um, which makes them um, the most important nuclear power um, uh, in the broader region beyond uh, Pakistan and, and India. Um, you will not hear a word from the Biden administration about that. Uh, that that's gonna continue as it has been um, and is with Israel using it as uh, uh, a hidden big stick, which everybody knows about and nobody wants to talk about. Well, well Egypt, Egypt talks about it a lot, actually. Egypt says, let's have a, a nuclear non-proliferation uh, non treaty and a nuclear-free zone in the Middle East, but no, Israel's not up for that. Why is it that they maintain this myth after all these years? It's, it's like the, the worst kept secret in the world. Everyone knows or assumes they, they have a substantial nuclear arsenal. So if they admit that they have them, then they have violated the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, and that entails all sorts of potential sanctions, including from the United States. Um, That's if right. They, if, they the admit, if they admit that they have them and join the Nuclear Non-Proliferation uh, uh, treaty, uh, then they have to allow inspections, which they certainly do not want to do. So this serves their needs very nicely. And you know, if, if the United States actually said, well, wait, yeah, you have nuclear weapons, you need to join the treaty and you need to submit to inspections like everybody else does, well then, okay. But, that, but the United States doesn't do that. And don't, uh, I don't, there's no chance that the Biden administration will do that. Okay, we have time for one more question, and we have one more questioner. Owen Murphy, thanks for joining us. What's your question? Oh, good evening. Thanks. I, it was the first time I participated in this, and thanks, Paul and Joel. Well, Cheryl had my question, which is the big elephant in the room, which is the question of nuclear power in the Middle East. And, of course, let's pretend that you don't have them, and we'll pretend that you don't, you don't, we don't have to ask you because you don't really have them. And everybody in the world knows that you do. It's, it's confounding to me because any other state in the world, in that world, there would be investigations immediately. So the United States basically is the key player in this uh, conversation that doesn't take place about the existence mm -hmm. of nuclear weapons in Israel. Am I right about that? Yes. 
Yeah. And and, I, and since that question has been really well answered by you, Joel, and nothing is going to change in that direction, and it is the big stick, um, that's a whole conversation that needs to take place, but it never will, it seems, at a level that will make any difference, except in Egypt. <laughs> but I have a further question. In, in this present COVID reality, Israel is successfully uh, probably doing a, the best job anywhere at getting vaccinations out. Mm -hmm. Right next door in the West Bank and in Gaza, it's a totally different question. How can we best help the Palestinian people in what I can only construe as a, a kind of an a, a, almost a medical apartheid in the way that things are developing in in Israel and in um, both uh, Gaza and the West Bank? How can we? Are there Palestinian organizations that we can support that you would recommend that we should that can help? Um, get this COVID um, under control? Good so medical apartheid is exactly oh. the right term, and it's an aspect of the broader apartheid, which is now pretty well established. Um, there are Palestinian relief organizations. There's the network of... Uh, uh, popular clinics that is led by Mustafa Barghouti, who was on Democracy Now! yesterday, I believe, uh, doing an interview, even as he is ill with COVID-19. Uh -huh. um, there, there are U.S.-based uh, uh, medical relief organizations, but um, they don't have vaccine. Uh, right. I, I, I don't know how we could do anything to help get vaccine to the Palestinians. Uh, th th that, that, that's a question that has to be asked, uh, answered by a medical specialist. Um, and, and the best Palestinian uh, who I know to answer that question would be Mustafa Barhouti, who was okay. interviewed by Amy Goodman yesterday, but he is ill. Um, I just exchanged uh, emails with Rita Jakaman, who uh, works in the uh, public health uh, department at Birzeit University. She would be another good person. She's very knowledgeable and very open to talking to people and 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 so on. I I just don't know the answer to that question. It's a very good question. I don't know the answer. Is it is it possible? Yeah. That... Oh, I'm sorry. I I uh, think our director cut you off. Not seeing you uh, had a follow up question, Owen, and he's not in me because he's offline right now before he gets it back. Joel, we're all out of time. I do keep track of time here because even though we're not in the TV studio anymore, we're still on local cable TV. So uh, 58 minutes is what we get. Uh, 30 second closing thoughts uh, to leave well, us with. I, I would say this. There are many, many reasons that we could be deeply, deeply depressed about what is going on, not only with regard to Israel-Palestine, but the Middle East more broadly. Uh, but as I said before, um, some things have begun to change. There has been a shift in the discourse and opening up of some spaces uh, that were not uh, so readily available uh, before in the United States. Um, but it is going to be a long slog. No one should believe that in the next uh, immediate foreseeable future, uh, the Palestinian people are going to be liberated and peace is going to break out. I mean, it's, it's going to be a mess for a while. I think that's one lesson those of us doing this work have, have uh, learned and taken on board for, for, for many years. But... Thank you again, Joel Bainan, Emeritus Professor of Middle East History at Harvard University. Um, our first guest to Other Voices TV 23 years ago, and now Other Voices Online. Thank you all watching at home for joining us. And um, as, I, as we log out, I, Joel, I, I have to keep telling my guests when we were in the TV studio, so many times you were in the studio, one of the uh, greatest pleasures was to walk my guest out to the parking lot and chit chat and say goodbye, but you don't get to do that. You're just going to disappear. So thank you again for joining us. 
thank you all watching at home. Uh, watch uh, for your follow-up email. We'll, we'll try to get you some more resources where you, you can take some action on uh, some of the things we learned today. Thank like you, that. Paul, and thank you everyone for attending. Okay, good night all. <laughs>